Hello, my name is Ray Perman, and I'm the author of Hubris, uh, How HBOS Wrecked the Best Bank in Britain, which was the story of the collapse of the bank HBOS in 2008, and in particular the destruction of Bank of Scotland. But now I'm going to be speaking uh, about an episode from a new book that I'm writing, which is the financial history of Edinburgh, from the Darien disaster uh, in the 18th century up to the 2008 credit crunch. And in particular, I'm going to talk about one chapter from that, about the financial ruin of Sir Walter Scott, the famous writer, and how he got out of it. In 1825, Sir Walter Scott was at the height of his powers and prestige. By training, he was a lawyer. He'd read law at Edinburgh University and then practised as an advocate. But by 1825, he had what was for him the ideal job, he was one of the principal clerks to the uh, high courts in Edinburgh, to the Court of Session, and his job was to sit in the court, uh, give legal advice to the judges if they needed it, but also to prepare a summary of the evidence uh, from which they could make their judgments. And this was ideal for him because it played to his strengths as a writer, uh, but it also meant that he had plenty of free time. The court only sat for half of the day, and then for only six months of the year. He was also a part-time sheriff in Selkirk, and again, that suited him very well because it got him down to the borders for three months of the year, which he thoroughly enjoyed. But his real love was writing, and by 1825, he was a very famous author. He started by publishing epic poems, things like The Lady of the Lake and The Lay of the Last Minstrel, which were hugely successful and sold tens of thousands of copies. But he was also uh, the writer of a famous uh, and very successful series of novels, the Waverley series, although he kept that a secret. The first book, Waverley, was produced um, and, and uh, credited to Anonymous, and the books thereafter were by the writers of Waverley, and Scott was very conscious of the fact that he ought to keep his own name out of it. He was a man of property. He owned a townhouse in Edinburgh, in Castle Street, and he also owned a country estate in the borders at, at Abbotsford. He'd bought a number of farms to give himself land. He built a small house on it, and then later he built a very large house on it and kept adding to it. He was a businessman. He was in demand for boards. So he sat on the board of a, a gas lighting company. He was the governor of an insurance company, and he was on the board of a second insurance company. He was also a promoter of the wool stapling company. I'm not sure what wool stapling was, but it also made loans to sheep farmers. And so he was in demand all around, one of the great and good. And in 1820, he had become president of the Royal Society. He'd also made a baronet, and this was in reward for his discovery of the Scottish crown jewels, which he found in the cellars of Edinburgh Castle. In 1822, he was asked by the city to orchestrate the celebrations for the visit of King George IV to Edinburgh, and this he did by uh, getting everybody dressed up in tartan, including the king, um, and arranging a number of dinners and parties and firework displays for the visit of the king. It cost him quite a bit because although Scott was no slouch at eating and drinking himself, he couldn't keep up with the king's consumption. And after the king had left, Scott spent three months in bed trying to recover from the episode. Nevertheless, in 1825, he was riding pretty high. He was well-loved uh, and well secure. But by 1826, uh, on the 16th of January, he learned that he was financially ruined. Now, how did this come about? For this, we need to talk about a little bit of the economic background to the age and a bit about what was happening in the world of finance. 1825, of course, was only 10 years after the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Britain had been at war for something like 25 years, first of all with the Revolutionary Wars and then against Napoleon, and the government had financed that by issuing lots of government debt. 
when they issued lots of debt, of course, the price went down uh, and the interest rates went up. But after the war, when the economy recovered from the wartime exertions, the government sought to bring down the national debt. And so it started to repurchase debt to buy back some of the securities it had issued during the wartime. This had the opposite effect. It, it drove up the price of government debt and uh, the converse was true of interest rates. Interest rates came down. So it was no longer profitable uh, to deposit money with banks, for example, because the interest rates were very low. It was no longer profitable to hold government securities because, again, they paid very low rates of interest. So people started to look for other ways of getting a good return on their money. A number of South American countries, for example, issued bonds in London to raise money, including Chile, Colombia and Argentina. And those bonds paid something like 6%, which was two or three times what you could get on a British government security. And there was a boom in new company formation, especially to um, uh, exploit new technologies like gas lighting, like railways, which were just beginning, like steamship services, which were also just beginning. And of course, there were a lot of spurious companies uh, promoted at that time where people invested in all sorts of strange companies that were being brought to the market. Inevitably, the boom that was going on in speculation and new company formation attracted frauds, the most famous of which was uh, McGregor McGregor, a returning soldier who'd fought in the British Army with Wellington in the Peninsular War, but had then gone to South America and had fought with Simon Bolivar, the, uh, uh, the liberator of Venezuela from Spanish rule. Gregor McGregor turned up in London and in Edinburgh, raising money for a colony in Central America called Poye, which he said he was the ruler of. It was a wonderful place. It had um, civilized towns. It had institutions. It had a very benign uh, climate. It had a very friendly population. The agriculture was amazing. And he did raise quite a lot of money, um, both to invest in this mythical colony, but also persuaded uh, settlers to take ship and go out there in a tragic uh, echo of the Darien scheme a uh, hundred years before. Unfortunately, it was a scam. Uh, when the settlers got there, they found that uh, there was no uh, civilization there. It, it was a pretty undeveloped jungle coast and many of them died of diseases. By the time the survivors got back, Gregor McGregor had gone to France. The whole boom was fueled by a number of years of uh, very good harvests. Some very good harvests meant that grain did not have to be imported from abroad and therefore gold did not have to be exported to pay for grain imports. But this came to an end abruptly in 1825 when it was a very bad harvest. There wasn't enough grain to feed the population, so grain had to be imported, which meant that gold went out of the country. And the Bank of England, which had been criticised for not restraining the speculative boom that was going on, now uh, acted to bring down credit to uh, restrict the money supply and to bring cold gold into the country. And one of the things they did was to stop discounting bills. Now, discounting bills was one of the ways in which merchants and individuals, and particularly of speculators in London, uh, raised their credit. And so when the bank put a stop to that, a number of people were severely embarrassed. There were a number of bankruptcies in London. And in particular, there was one firm called Hearst Robinson, which went bust pretty quickly. The relevance of this to Sir Walter Scott was that Hearst Robertson were his London publishers and his London agents. He thought uh, for a while that, uh, in fact, it would all blow over, Hearst Robertson would be able to be solved. But what he didn't know was that uh, Joseph Robertson, one of the partners in the company, had actually bought £40,000 of hops, hoping to corner the hop market 
and drive up the price and sell at a profit. Uh, speculation in hops being, of course, not part of the normal trade of a publisher and literary agent. Unfortunately, he did this with borrowed money, and uh, he did it at a time when there was no shortage of hops. So the price of hops did not go up in the way that he anticipated. He couldn't sell them, and he could not pay off the debt that he'd incurred. Uh, because the bank had... Um, Restricted credit, he couldn't borrow any money anywhere else, and so Hearst Robertson went bust. Now began a series of interlocking relationships between Hearst Robertson, between Scott's main publisher in Edinburgh, Archibald Constable, and between his printer, James Ballantyne. And it turned out that each of them had been over trading for a long time, had been borrowing heavily and had been uh, discounting each other's bills. They had been guaranteeing the debts of each of them. So uh, it all came home to roost. Hurst Robertson couldn't pay its debts to Archibald Constable. Archibald Constable couldn't pay its debts to James Ballantyne. They had all borrowed from banks and they were unable to repay their bank loans. Now, Walter Scott, unbeknownst to most people, was a senior partner in the printing company, James Ballantyne. Because all these companies were unlimited partnerships, he therefore had a responsibility for the debts of that company and because it had guaranteed the debts of Archibald Constable and of Hearst Robertson, he also found that he had responsibility for their debts as well. Archibald Constable himself, the, uh, the man, quickly went bankrupt. His house was sold, all his possessions were sold, and then James Ballantyne went bankrupt too. So Scott was the last man standing, and his responsibility for the debts which totaled something like £121,000 in, uh, in 1826 money, something like £10 million in today's money, was much more than his net worth and much more than he could earn. But he did not want to go bankrupt. He feared the stigma of going bankrupt and he also felt that he had a moral responsibility to pay his debts. The Duke of Buccleuch offered to pay off all of Scott's debts, but Scott declined that offer and decided that he would work to pay the debts off himself. To do this, he had to uh, reach an agreement with his creditors, mainly with the banks, and to try and do that, he enlisted the help of an old friend, uh, Sir William Forbes, who'd been at school and at university with Walter Scott and was now the principal of uh, the bank, Sir William Forbes and Company, and he undertook to negotiate with the other creditors in order to allow Scott to um, go into a trust arrangement, not be bank made bankrupt, and work to pay off the debt. This was agreed and Scott began working by writing more books and he was prodigious. He wrote something like nine books between uh, 1826 and his death in 1832, uh, and he got enormous sums of money for him. He could still command big advances on his novels. Um, on the novel Woodstock, for example, which was the latest in the Waverley novel series, he secured an advance of £8,000. That's something like £650,000 in today's money. Uh, and he uh, quipped in his diary, not bad for three months' work. But then he embarked on a two-volume biography of Napoleon, and he managed to secure an advance of £18,000 on those two books. So within a couple of years, he had halved the debt, uh, and that had, uh, the, as I say, he died in 1832, and at that time the debt had been considerably reduced. But the money kept coming in even after Scott's death, uh, and by 1846, the sale of his remaining copyrights 
enabled the trustees to pay off all the creditors. And so they all got their money back and Sir Walter's honour was saved. By entering into that trust arrangement, they did much better than the creditors of Archibald Constable or James Ballantyne because those creditors only got 10% of, uh, of what they were owed or even in the case of Ballantyne, 5% of what they were owed. Scott's principles stand and it is acceptance, uh, a moral acceptance for the debts he had incurred paid off for everybody in the end.